perfect. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a special week for us for several reasons. One, uh, Friday is no class uh, due to the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. It's a big family occasion, and, and we usually take two days off, Thursday and Friday. So Friday, no class. Tomorrow on Tuesday, uh, there will be a special guest meeting with Elkanan Mosel, uh, who is a top was a leader in high dimensional probability in many, many other areas of mathematics and computer science. So please don't miss it. It will be special for us. And also, it's a special week because we start uh, a new block, which is mathematics of machine learning. So we will do it now. What's this lecture? 34 in high dimensional probability and applications to data science. Now this time is, oh, share, share, yeah, I forgot. This time I especially would like to ask you to, uh, to encourage you to ask questions. Interrupt me please at any time, ask questions. This is especially in this first class on uh, machine learning, on fund foundations of machine learning. There is a lot of terminology and machine learning like their terminology. And there is a, a general setup. So please ask, ask a lot of clarifying questions or just mention something, observe something. Um, some of you know this stuff already from working in companies and, uh, and in research. So please do that. Great. Any questions before we begin? Good. Okay, cool. So machine learning. Um, what is learning? What is understanding? What is attention? What is experience in humans, in animals? How do we make computers do this all things? How do, you, how do we achieve artificial intelligence or at least a more modest goal, artificial artificial way of computers to learn, to understand something, to keep attention on, on, on tasks and so on and so forth. Currently, the best possible solution that we know is based on mathematics and is based on high dimensional probability. That's because we we usually view the data as a very complex data, so we model it as something random, and we know the data lives in high dimensional world. So it's not surprising that something like the project on the program on machine learning is usually based on uh, on probability. There are two, there are many, several types of learning. The biggest two ones are uh, unsupervised and supervised learning. Unsupervised <clears throat> and supervised learning. Basically, we as humans, we can either learn from our own experience or from a teacher or a parent or some, someone more experienced than us. Uh, infants, for example, they learn from their own experience of the, maybe in the first couple of days and, and animals too. And then there is also supervised learning when, when you have someone who is telling you what the world is about. We have seen examples of both actually types of learning in this course already. So let's, let's start with those examples on unsupervised machine learning. An example of this is clustering where we have just, just points. No one tells us what these points mean. Uh, no one tells us that they're clustered into two groups, uh, right. nothing. So these are, this is a situation where we have unlabeled data. Encoded as points in, let's say N points in D-dimensional space. For example, it could be N cells, uh, and in each cell we do single cell sequencing and we get 
the D, uh, we get the RNA sequencing. So we get the, the expressions of the G genes. And we plot them with some visualization tool perhaps. And we see, oh, actually there are two clusters. The, the thing is clustered into two parts. And we did this separation into clusters. So perhaps there are two types of cells. which may, for example, mean that the cells differentiate uh, at the early stage of the embryo development, or maybe there is two, 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 two types of cancer that this cancer cells demonstrate, something like that. So this is a data exploration situation where the, we're not, we do not know which cells is, is, is which, and, and, and they're unlabeled. We're just learning from our own experience of observing these cells. It's unsupervised learning. The supervised learning, this is actually what we will concentrate in this block of the course. That's an example of this is classification, where we have labeled data. So some points are marked as ones, let's say, and some points are marked with zeros. So there are I just put zeros and ones in the location of this of the of these points. So the labeled data comes in pairs, x1, y1, where x is a location and y is a label, xn, yn. X's are in the d-dimensional space, just as before, and y's perhaps they are in zero, one. They're they're binary you know, labels. So for example, we can be looking at n people and uh, the X, the location of these people indicate the symptoms. So we have D symptoms. And YIs, the labels indicate whether the people have, uh, have cancer or no cancer. This is our training data. The people are already, we assume that the data that these people have already been diagnosed by somebody. That's what the labels are for. We, we, we get these labels, we know them. So some, some doctor already diagnosed these people and we're, we are supposed to learn from that doctor. And we're supposed to learn how to diagnose cancer, how to diagnose a new patient if, if he or she arrives. So what we want to do, our goal, is we would like to build a code. We would like to build a, um, this thing. It's called an oracle. An oracle that the diagnosis cancer. From the symptoms. So for example, if we have a new patient. X and plus one and we put it through the oracle, the oracle will give it YN plus one, the supposed label, whether the person has cancer or not. Okay, good, any questions on the general goal? Not, not so mathematical yet, but just just one step toward mathematics of this. Okay, cool. All right, we'll, we'll be working with supervised learning only in this block. And we will try to build a general mathematical framework first. So put everything into mathematical language of supervised learning. Okay, here is how. And yes, I'm sorry, the machine learning people love terminology. There's a lot of terminology here, probably unnecessary, but I will, I will shower it on you because if you, if you want to read papers in the area, there all the people will, will use all these words. Okay, but you can forget it later if you don't like the terminology. Anyway, the, back, 
the backbone of supervised machine learning is an unknown distribution on the pair x y so this is where um this is like the objective reality this is our symptoms and the distribution of the symptoms in the population that's what human have humans have and distribution of cancer this is unknown distribution so we have an, a pair of random variables or maybe vectors xy in somewhere um any sets so this is this could be any any sets x measures let's say the locate x indicates the location of patients for example uh, or, or symptoms and y indicates their label so for example in the previous case we had x be the d symptoms and why the label being cancer or no cancer x y this, this x y is is the objective truth we don't have x y we don't know the distribution of, of y so the distribution is unknown if we know if we knew that distribution the, our test would be very simple if we knew the distribution we would know exactly how symptoms uh, of cancer correlate with the actual diagnosis then we don't need anything we don't need training data we don't need any any machine learning algorithms we can just output this correlation any person comes with symptoms say yeah sure you're 80 percent to have cancer something like that but we do not know that distribution that's our goal to learn it in some way x and y the symptoms and the the diagnosis for example are correlated usually we we assume that they are correlated ideally strongly correlated ideally x is uniquely determined or y label is uniquely determined from x so this symptom if i look at the symptoms if i am a perfect doctor i would exactly tell you you have cancer with 100 percent probability or you don't have cancer with 100 percent probability but sometimes just the symptoms do not determine that sometimes you need more tests for example and so we usually assume that there is some correlation but not deterministic one okay Good. So the joint distribution again is unknown. What we see, what we do know, is the training data. Mathematically, it's just um, it's just n independent and identically distributed random vectors distributed the same way as x y they are identical independent and identically distributed Let's, let me call this copies of x y meaning that they're coming from the same distribution of x y these are our patients this is our training data our goal is to predict y from x the best we can so we want to construct to build an oracle which mathematically is just a function just any function h that transforms symptoms into diagnosis so if you apply it to x we would like to have approximately y we would like to make it in order to make to to make predictions for new unseen data if a new person comes n plus one person comes then we would have a proxy x h of x n plus one will, ha will have to be approximately the same as y n plus one 
Again, YN plus one is objective truth, whether the person actually has cancer or not. And we would like to approximate that. So that will be our ideal algorithm where X and plus one, the symptoms will be the input and the diagnosis will be the output. May I ask a question? Yes, you should. <laughs> um, maybe you'll talk about it later, but um, so uh, my question is, imagine I'm trying to build this Oracle, right? And um, imagine I like test in new, a few, few new patients, right? And I get not very good results. So how do I know what does that mean? Does this mean that my Oracle is bad? Or does that mean that I already made all potential there was for, um, for because they are correlated, but not per, perhaps they are not very heavily correlated and I don't know that. So how do I know if my Oracle is good or bad or did I do everything I could and it's- Yeah, that, mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question, right? How do we test this algorithm? We, the best way to do that, maybe in, to answer your question would be to, to take a holdout data, separate your data into two parts, learn from one part, so build the Oracle only on the first half of the patients, N over two, and use the second half to test your Oracle. If the test is bad, uh, what does that mean? That, well, that again could mean two things, right? We do not know. Um, yeah, how do we... How do we know if there maybe yeah what's wrong right if the symptoms are are not indicative of the uh, of the diagnosis or our oracle is is bad for that that's a good question I don't know I mean obviously do? in practice I would not use this this it is bad anyway but but still like how do I can, can I like no, in practice should, should I find new algorithm to predict or can I like tell somehow <laughs> if I did everything I could. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Guys, do you, do you know anyone? What some of you I know working on with this in practice? What what would you do? Uh, you could only compare your metrics on train data and test data. Yeah, and test. if on if on train data it, it's a good fit, uh, then you are like fair enough, Chanya. Over overfitting. Overfitting, yeah. Yes, yeah, we'll talk about overfitting. Let's say it's a good, suppose on the training data, it's a good fit. Uh, then, uh, well, good. Maybe it's not an over, how do we know it's overfitting or not? It's just... Yeah, if, if training data is good and uh, holdout data is bad, that's overfitting. Yeah. Oh, but hold, oh, guys, let's say we, we just separate our, our data into two sets uh, arbitrarily. So there are they're equally good or bad, right? We just have n over two random subset as a as a training data, n over two random subset as a test data. We do this training, and on the training data, it's it's okay. It looks okay, like 90 percent good. And then we test it on the test data, and it is bad. What what would that mean? Overfitting. Overfitting. Yeah. Okay, so that means your algorithm is actually not so good. Could it be? Okay, okay. Could it be? That, um, that the data, the, the label as, are not very co nicely correlated. Let's say you have this, this, the YIs are not very good correlated with the XIs, so you train. Well, it's still overfitting. Okay, I agree, it's still overfitting. But do we know, but how, but still the, the original question of Maxim is unanswered, right? How do we know if the data is bad? And that's what we, why we're doing overfitting? Or I think uh, the assumption the assumption that we have this function f is the core assumption of applying machine learning. So like like you said here that ideally y is f from x. If there is no dependency, if there is no dependency, then um, yeah, no, some, we, we, we yeah, don't yeah, have no to do. Uh, how do we know? Is there a way to test that there is no dependency? That this assumption is wrong? Do you know if there's if there is any way for us to test if there is no? I mean, at at some point you should like say, oh, I so I did bad, or should I go to 
the person who gave me the data and said, oh, your data is not very good. You should yes. you should add new information and then I can do something something work. Anything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So how do you so, decide between the two? Pablo, yeah, and, do you know? Yeah. How do we in practice decide which one is which one is which? The data is bad or our algorithm is bad? Uh, well, I think uh, one of the ways is to see the precision on the train data. So uh, we, we can kind of see the evolution as we train our model. If there uh -huh. is no correlation, the evolution will be basically flat, right? We will not yeah, improve. Suppose that there is correlation. So maybe we're overfitting, maybe, but maybe we're, uh, oh, I, oh, I see what you mean, okay. Yeah, so, so okay. In, in case if we have correlation and we are overfitting, then the training on, on, on the training set precision will increase and the training of the and and the precision of the holdout data will uh flat flat out will will stay still right we mm -hmm. will stop uh, in, improving there and if there is no correlation then both will will not improve so something like that so and and if we're not overfitting right it's weird yeah okay uh, yeah okay 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 that's that's a i think that's that's there's something there okay there's one way another way suggested was uh adversarial validation maybe i don't know <laughs> have an adversary validate but yeah okay let's go on with this we'll we'll keep keep thinking about this as we um as we are building this mathematical framework so that's this is a very good question i think raised by maxim which, which ways which do we know if this assumption is actually true and if it is not true then how do we know that okay so we can do this with holdout data and uh, and training data hopefully any other questions or suggestions Okay, perfect. So we would like to have that. We would like to have a good oracle that uh, approximately uh, that approximates the labels. We need to, to to quantify that. What do you mean by approximately the same? And so, how do we measure that? For this, we define some function called the loss function. We fix some function called the loss function to measure the accuracy of approximation. Um, and the accuracy of the approximation is usually called the risk, or sometimes it's called uh, test error. So R of H for any oracle, like I, I construct some oracle, how do we measure its accuracy? whether it's good or not. Here is what we do. We take h of x. It's supposed to be close to y. So we measure this with the, with the loss function like this and take expected value. So it's an average, average loss for the new data, for unseen data. x and y have the same distribution as xn plus 1 and yn plus 1, the new patient. So that's why it's called the test error. If you test it on a new patient, our oracle, if you test the oracle on a new patient, the loss should be should be small. So the, probably most of the time you'll be working with it with the, the simplest loss. Quadratic loss. Well, L of, let's say, Ts is T minus S squared. So the risk is just the, the mean squared error, H of X minus Y squared. H of X, our prediction, take the actual label, Y, compare them, square, take expectation, you'll get some approximate error, the average error. Okay, so this is a this is the risk. The risk measures the quality of the algorithm, quality of our oracle.
quadratic loss is good, but it's unbounded. So people sometimes prefer logistic loss that is more forgiving to outliers. Logistic loss looks like that, not defined ex exactly, but it's it's a function that that grows from, from zero to one. So it's always bounded between zero and one, and therefore it's a little bit more forgiving to, to outliers. We also have in this, uh, in some lectures we've seen hinge loss and so on. I'll not, we'll not go there, but let's think about quadratic loss. If you are, if you think about some loss, the uh, most of the time is gonna be quadratic. Okay, so far so good. So we have an unknown distribution on X, Y on the pairs. We would like to predict X from Y with some, how do we do this? Technically, we build an Oracle a function. We have not built it yet, but we suggest the way to test how good the function is. Um, and that is with the risk, how good the prediction is with the risk. Make this perfect. Now, the big question is how do we construct the oracle, right? So how do we how do we construct the oracle H? There are situations we're, so we, you can you can take h to be a very complex function or a very simple function, and either way you can get one of these situations. So here is here is an example where I put the patients with cancer here, no cancer here, and one way to separate them would be to go and exactly separate zeros from ones. So this function, this function will assign value one on the, to the right of this curve and value zero to the left of this curve, any point, right? Then it's, it's a diagnosis. The problem with this function, with this Oracle, is that it chases the, the outliers. This zero wasn't supposed to be there. This one probably wasn't supposed to be there. Maybe it's just outliers. Or maybe it's just our doctors weren't careful enough and misdiagnosed. So the training data wasn't so good, but our age was trying to chase every possible outlier. And so that's the problem that's called overfitting. It is not a good age because it pays particular attention to the outliers, which are probably wrong in the first place. You do not want such age. This problem is called overfitting. Okay, why is it so bad again? Is that in the in the new patient, you will probably not see this. These are artifacts. The outliers are artifacts. You're not supposed to be chasing them. The better situation would be to do something like this, maybe. So here is another situation at the opposite end of the spectrum, which is underfitting, where we, cho we, we, we choose H to be too simple, just like this, just one line that separates them. In this case, you're you will probably have a lot of outliers. Um, sorry, not a lot of a lot of misclassific, misclassified patients, because maybe cancer is not linearly separate, separable like this. Ideally, what we would like to have is a function like this, that is simple enough, so we, it will not be tempted to to chase outliers, but informative enough, so that you will have maybe some misclassifications, but not too many of them. This is just a good fit. So again, the spectrum is between un overfitting like this, will be a bad, bad oracle, underfitting, also a bad oracle, and this is just the right fit. Problem is how do we choose the right one? How do we know what's the right one? There's a trade-off and, and how do we quantify this? So here is a common strategy to do that. Is to fix in advance, to fix a collection of functions, probably simple ones, a collection of functions from which you will choose H. And then only choose H from that collection. 
So fix some collection of functions called capital H. This is called the hypothesis class. And then select the oracle from that collection, the best oracle from that collection that best fits the data. So here are some examples. In one, on the one end of the spectrum, you can just choose all functions. But we saw how that is a problem that, that leads to overfitting. Choose all functions and you will be chasing the outliers and that's not so good. Going a little one, one step down would be, or maybe a lot of step downs will be to choose all linear functions. So H would be all functions of the form, actually affine functions, if you be um, completely accurate. Wx, that's linear, plus b, plus offset, where w is some vector in rd and b some offset r. This is the one, this is the class where we, which we considered in support vector machines. So then you will choose the best linear function that separates at least zero from one, zeros from ones. In the classification problems, because we know the labels are zero or ones already, we can choose the sign, for example. This is a function that, that has this separation interface as a linear separation interface, and then puts ones on one side and zeros on the other side. That's support vector. This is actually support vector machine. And then you can increase complexity. If, let's say, if you believe that the cancer is not linearly separable, then maybe it's separable with surfaces of degree two, with quadratic surfaces, or maybe by polynomials of some fixed degree. So you can include maybe some polynomials, all polynomials P of X. Of bounded degree, let's say degree less than less than two, or maybe three. Finally, if you're already working with something, if you're already working, let's say with neural nets, with deep learning, then we can choose H to be all functions that can be realized by a given given architecture by a given neural network, neural network architecture. So let's say feed forward neural network, it computes certain functions. As you input X, it outputs Y, depending on what weights of the edges are. And as we vary, vary weights, there we make the neural network compute different functions. Actually, we do not know very well what kind of functions these are. There is no kind of closed form description of what neural network can compute. But we can just take that as a class H. In the very, on the end of that spectrum would be uh, the class that just consists of maybe two functions. You're choosing the best, the, the better between the two. So that's that leads to hypothesis testing. Is this better separation of cancer and non-cancer, or this is a better separation of cancer and no cancer? 
So that's hypothesis testing. There is no systematic way to choose this uh, the, the hypothesis class. Unfortunately, it's more art than than science. But these are examples that most of the time people work with. Okay, so far so good. Hypothesis class clear. So we choose a collection. It's our kind of dictionary, a bag of these functions that that we can use, and then we choose the best one from that bag. The best, the absolutely the best oracle that can be chosen is the one that minimizes the the risk. So that that would be the best situation. Well, unfortunately, it's not computable because the risk is not computable. But if we can minimize the total population risk, then we just choose H star. I'll write it this way: arg min, which means that I'm choosing I'm choosing H from the hypothesis class from my collection of preset collection of functions that minimizes the risk. that would lead here we're kind of playing god because that would lead to the best possible oracle but that require us that requires from us to know the distribution of xy to know how the symptoms are correlated with cancer generally not for training data but generally to know the nature of things to know the nature of the human body if we know that then this is how we build the oracle but we do not know that we only know the training data. So unfortunately, that it cannot be computed. Because we don't get to see X and Y. We get to see the training data. So we, we estimate this whole thing by, the compute, by computing this on the sample only. Let's call it Rn of H instead of expected value over the entire population we take expected value we take average over the sample oh. y i and h n star is the arg max arg min sorry H and H are N of H. Yeah. This is called the empirical risk. Empirical risk. And also is called the training error. For the obvious reason, right? The training error, if we know it for any age that we wanted to test, what we do, we look at how good it performs on each sample point, and then we average over the sample points. Right? Take the loss for each point, mismatch, and then take. For example, if L is quadratic, And a, uh, if L is quadratic and Yi is R0, 1, so it's binary classification. Let's say this is, oh, sorry. Let me, let me do this, sorry. Let me do the square one step here. So H of Xi minus Yi squared. So each of this is 0 and 1. So this would be what? h of xi could be 0 or 1, yi could be 0 or 1, so the difference could be 0 or plus minus 1, but when we square it's again 1. It's 0 if, if the oracle is correct, 
and one if the oracle is incorrect when we sum all these squares we just get the percentage of misclassified points misclassified training data <clears throat> so that's a loss we would like to minimize the percentage of misclassified training data we build the oracle so it it makes that percentage as small as possible and we choose the oracle from the preset collection of possible oracles hypotheses So far, so good. Okay, good. So that thing cannot be computed, the population version, but the the sample version can be computed, and that's the algorithm. That's that's what we normally do. So this is computable, at least in principle. Computable in the sense that we have the information that we need to compute this. It's only it only involves the data, the training data, which we know. And so in principle, we can compute it. But of course, in practice, it may be very hard. It could be and be hard to do that. But in principle, possible. So finally, just one more piece of terminology is how do we measure that the algorithm generalizes well that the algorithm doesn't overfit generalization error measures how how well the algorithm generalizes this is just a difference so, so we look at you know, we look at the performance uh, performance of our algorithm so this is a risk so, okay so think of what is this this is we we computed hn star from the data that's our oracle this will become our algorithm and then we and then we evaluate its risk so evaluate the misclassification minus the best possible one this one is the best possible oracle that no one can compute. So this is a generalization error. Of course, it's greater than zero because, because H star minimizes the risk. And this is what we can compute. So this one measures how well the algorithm generalizes. And so we have now the algorithm. It's a meta algorithm. It's called ERM, empirical risk minimization algorithm that can solve and potentially can solve any any machine learning process, any supervised machine learning problem, which is uh, so the input is the training data. training data um, then we compute our n of h which is right there compute the risk we compute h n star by minimizing the training risk and output output uh, and so well, output. So the, the, the result of this is the oracle. On input x, it outputs hn star of x. And this is how we compute it. We minimize empirical risk. Okay, good. All right, so this is a meta algorithm. Any questions? All right, so let's see how it works. 
examples, a couple examples. Let's take H to be all functions. We know it's with, it's going to be overfitting, but let's let's do this nevertheless, just to see what what happens. All functions, and let's assume for simplicity that the lay that the that you can in principle you can exactly diagnose cancer from the symptoms. So y equals f of x. There is some function that uniquely determines the diagnosis, although we may not know it. We would like to have it, so we know that there exists a perfect oracle. which is F. Since we know that the, the symptoms exactly determine whether a person has cancer or not, we just know, do not know how, there is in principle a perfect work whose risk is zero. So R of H. Remember what our, I'll, I'll write it again because there's a lot of notation here. R of H is the loss on, uh, h of x and y is zero because h of x equals y. Think of L a quadratic loss. So there is, in principle, there is a perfect oracle. And there is a perfect, and of course, if, if, we, uh, if our class includes all functions, then we can fit exactly any function. So there is also a perfect fit to the training data. So I can always choose the function that takes any patients to its diagnosis because we don't restrict the class of functions. The hypothesis class is everything. So the training error is also zero. So it looks like a perfect situation, right? Look at the training sample. We get exactly the function that we want. We know the training risk is zero. The, the, the population risk is zero. Everything is cool, except it doesn't generalize as well. <laughs> but this is a, hor this is a horrible algorithm. It, it doesn't generalize well. If you evaluate the actual risk on this function, it's, it's large. It's going to be large usually. And that, that was the situation that we saw right here. That we can fit if we don't restrict any class of function, we can, we were able to ch chase every possible outlier like this. But this doesn't generalize well. If the outliers in different locations, then we have a different story. This is, this is a situation of an algorithm of a learning algorithm that memorizes very well, it memorizes the training data, but it doesn't generalize. This is what we, uh, you know, when, when the little kids go to school, we always tell them, okay, please don't just memorize the facts, you need to understand them. Uh, and uh, how do we know what understanding is? Is Mathematically, it's, it's a generalization error that for example, if you, you've, you've seen this, for example, dogs in circus that when asked what is one plus one, the dog barks off, off, and, and it's asked what's, what's one plus two, the dog barks off, off, off. Does that mean that the dog knows the answer to, knows how to add numbers? No, it doesn't mean. It means that the dog memorized them. So the dog, through the training, performed, found this oracle kind of that overfits the data. What does that mean also? It doesn't generalize. So if you ask the dog, what is two plus two, for example, the dog will be completely, completely not know it. How do we measure that? Well, we measure it with the, with the generalization error. Right? We give the dog a new example and the, exa the, dog is a lot. the dog is lost there. The dog cannot answer a new example. And that, is, and that is exactly the generalization error. It will be large. So this is an example of an algorithm that memorizes things well, but does not generalize.
Another example, a better one, is where you include only, let's say, linear functions. And we do quadratic loss. We choose quadratic loss. So the linear, let's see, the linear function is this w on the training set xi plus b minus yi squared. That's a loss. Then we sum up, divide by n. That is our loss training is rn h. And then we minimize it over all w and b. Yeah, good. So we, the square is because it's quadratic loss. Then the risk is the average, the, the, the training risk is the average over the sample of the suggested oracle, which is this, it's h of, x, h of xi minus yi. So it tests the, the difference here. And when you see this, what, a, what is this <laughs> in disguise? What is this algorithm? You minimize, you want it to fit the best w. You want to find the best linear function that approximates the data. What is this algorithm? It's a it's like convex linear program. Regression. Yeah, it's, it's a linear regression, exactly. That's nothing but a linear regression. So if the data is, is this, let's say, the algorithm attempts to find the best linear fit. It's like that. This is my y and this is x, let's say. And these points here, the points are uh, x, i, y, i. And the line is y equals w, x plus b. The x dimension is d dimensional, actually, but you can think of d equal one here. So by minimizing this, we, we, we find the best fit of the line to the data. That's linear regression, of course. That is an example of a, of a machine, of a general machine learning framework, a simple example. And once we find the line, it gives us a prediction. So if we have a new patient, for example, a new point X here, then what is our output? The output would be this. This is our Y. So it just the, the prediction for, for new X would be just a point on the line. That's our oracle. Good. Any questions? I have like a small question about the the error that was before we were went to examples. It was how was it called? Generalizing error. Yes, yeah, generalization. Yeah, yeah, generalization error. So, uh, again, um, the, ah, oh, okay, I got it. It's exact the exact question I asked before, right? So mm -hmm. we, we have no way of no way of telling this in like practice, right? So we don't know how close we are in general. Not not in first example we are, but like everywhere else, we don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so what you mean now, you mean that, that the generalization error cannot be computed because we don't know what R of H star is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, R. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, R is just, uh, uh, um, yeah, R, R of H and star can be computed. Yeah, that, that's, that's okay. 
yeah, h in star is this, and then you just put it in. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, but you can take expected value. R is R is expected value over the population, so you can just approximate it from the new data, from the unseen data. Just taking yeah. average of the unseen data. That's that's all right. It's it's possible, but the problem is that you do not know what h h star is. That's the biggest one. So you do not know that. But exactly, Maxim. So what we will do now in the in the like four minutes, uh, we will try to bound the generalization error by something that we can compute. And that will be very useful because then we can estimate the generalization error. So our next, our goal, actually our, our biggest goal now for the remaining part of this block will be to bound generalization error. Why is that we can't do anything with this term? Like this, this risk, this error, R of H star, that's the best the model can give us, right? If we choose the hypothesis class, if we are bound ourselves to, let's say, quadratic functions, then the best we can do is this. That's it, the answer. But the question is, can we approximate that? Can we do at least as good as this? Can we bound the generalization error from the data? So that's the question. So how do we bound? The generalization error. How do we find al algorithms that generalize well? And again, generalization error. Let me just copy it from here. Based this one. And how do we build algorithms that was generalization error is small? So things that not just memorize facts, but learn. That's a main objective of machine learning. A little more intelligent thing. Okay, so here is a lemma. We'll give it. We'll give a proof in two, two lines. How to bind the how to bi bound the generalization error by something we can compute. It is bounded by two. Then we take the worst possible on the class in the hypothesis class R n of h minus R of h. This the right. Uh, we'll we'll give a proof in a, in in a couple lines later. But the point is that the right hand side we can compute in principle. Uh, R. Let's just remind R of H. That's expected value of the loss. Like this, and we can compute it from the new data from the unseen data. And R n of H. We can always compute. That's just the average over the sample. And then we 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 run another minimis another optimization problem on the right hand side to to maximize this. So this is how we can test if the algorithm generalizes well. As actually, I think it answers Maxim's question at the very beginning of the class. Okay, it's a simple observation. There is nothing med deeply mathematical there. Let's let's do it. Let's just interpret things correctly. So R of H N star. We would like to bound bound this thing. Okay, what is this? Let's think. So let's let's actually call the right hand side something. Let's call this epsilon. Suppose it is small. Let's think of this as a small small number, like an error. Okay, so I would like to replace in okay. I would like to replace here R by Rn. The true risk, population risk by the empirical risk. That's the only replacement I have now, the only thing that changes on the right-hand side. What do we pay for such a replacement? Well, they're always within epsilon from each other. Right? That's what epsilon is. Epsilon measures the worst discrepancy between the population risk and the true risk. Population risk and true risk. It's always for any H, it's bounded by epsilon in the class. Agreed? It's just, just from, from what epsilon is. Perfect. Now we would like to, now I'm saying, okay, H n star. So what actually minimizes R n? It's, it's H n star. This one minimizes Rn. This is how we chose it. This is our oracle. 
So now I can replace H and star by H just for free. And this is H star minimizes the, the, uh, the empirical risk. So for any other function it could be only larger. Good. It's just, just from a, yeah, guys, okay, we're good. Yeah, that's just, just from yep. the definition. Okay. Uh, and now I'm playing this trick again. I'm replacing Rn, the empirical risk, back by population risk. Again, what do we pay for that? Another epsilon. Epsilon measures the worst possible discrepancy between population and empirical risk. So I pay another epsilon. So this is because H stars and H. And that's it. QED. If you move the terms around, simplify that. We, we get this lemma. So now we can we have a way uh, to, if not exactly compute, but at least to approximate um, the the quality of an algorithm to generalize, maybe to understand things instead of just memorize them. There is this practical practical way of doing this, but we'll we'll try to bound it next time. Any questions? Hey guys, good. Next time, so please come on Tuesday tomorrow. Of course, we have the meeting before the next class and before next Wednesday. If you can spend maybe, if you can maybe ten minutes, seven minutes, five minutes before class, just to review to review the the setup, all this terminology. It doesn't bothers me that there is so much terminology, empirical risk, population, this, 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 too much. But so please review it so it kind of soaks in you, so we can next time be prepared. I'll remind it, of course, again. Good. Hey, guys, if you don't have any question, then, uh... oh, let me stop recording. Stop.